to the choir uh, room. No. We are delighted that you are here. Uh, we're in a series called What Do We Believe? And uh, as I said, this week we'll be talking about sin. So we're glad you're here. We're glad you feel welcome. Let us prepare our hearts for worship.
affirm our faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered in Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, with the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Causes us to sin. 
It's something within us that causes us to sin. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So sin isn't just something outwardly that we do that we say, oh, I forgot to wash my hands. I'm sorry, God. I'll wash it next time. And we're forgiven. It's something much deeper than that. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for the ability to come together and to worship together and to learn more about you and to think about our ways versus your ways. So be with us as we explore why we sin. We ask this in the name of your Son. Amen. Thank you. Uh, uh, 
In Judaism, they worship the God of Abraham. And as in Islam, they worship the God of Abraham. But their experience and how they see God is different. So the, the simple answer is we are the only ones. We are the only religion. Christianity is the only religion that worships God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But there are other religions that worship the God of Abraham. They just don't uh, frame it as we do. As for Hindu and Buddhism and some of the other ones, uh, they have a whole different uh, ball game. So we won't go there. Uh, but that's the simple answer and the more complex answer, and I hope that helps you. But in understanding it in terms of musical terms, we see God as rhythm. We see Jesus Christ as the melody. We see the Holy Spirit that goes with us as the harmony. And we'll be talking about that next week and the following week. But as we talked about providence and the way uh, creation works, we talk about dissonance. And dissonance is that tension in music that we feel that calls for a resolution. And that is something that is a part of creation. And then we talked about discord. That's when you just hit your fist on the piano and it's just noise. And we live in a day and age where there is a whole lot of noise. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about sin, and we're going to look at it as noise or discord. It doesn't, it doesn't drive anything. It doesn't have any purpose. Dissonance is a tension that drives us to things. So dissonance is a part of creation, drives us to innovations. And we see what it drives us in medicine and in science, in the law, in sociology. We always see this drive toward something. So dissonance is a part of God's creation. It's a part of God's plan. A discord is just noise. Sin is just noise. And sin happens when something goes wrong. Now, let's talk about where do those sources of discord come from. And we'll look at it in musical terms. Sometimes we get off beat, do we not? The music's flowing like this, and we're off beat. Some of us just don't have very good rhythm. And so we're, we're going to a different beat than the music is. We may not mean to be doing that, but it's what we're doing. We're rebelling against the rhythm of God. God has a rhythm in the universe, and we decided to march to our own drummer, like Adam and Eve did. We decided to do our own thing and not be in tune with the rhythm of God. Another thing we try to do is sometimes we play our own tune so that we don't go along with what uh, Jesus is doing. We decide to do our own little thing, play our own tune, listen to our own music, hear our own song. And so instead of being a part of what Jesus is doing here on earth, we are doing something else. Sometimes we just hit the wrong note. We miss the mark. We mean to do that, but we miss the mark. Um, when I was in college, I was playing the organ for one of the choirs at Baylor, and we were doing this uh, Vivaldi piece, and anybody that's played Vivaldi knows how difficult it is, and this was an organ piece, and I 
must have spent hundreds of hours practicing it, but it was just beyond my skill level. And when we, uh, when we uh, sang it for, um, at First Baptist in Dallas, I just was humiliated because I couldn't keep up with it. I hit, kept hitting the wrong notes. And then sometimes we get out of tune, do we not? You know, when the orchestra comes out, the first violin stands up and, and gets in tune, and then everybody tunes to that. And if you have an intermission, they come back and they do it again. Sometimes we play out of tune. We actually have some pipes that are out of tune, and you can hear them. And there's absolutely nothing Cynthia can do to make that play in tune. It's going to call, it's going to take a organ tuner to come and adjust the pipes. So those are our ways that sin starts to take hold in our lives. We get off beat from God's rhythm, we decide to play our own tune, we hit the wrong notes, or we get out of tune. So I'm going to read the scripture today, and we're from... Oh, I'm going to actually read a second scripture, but this one's going to do first. But this is from the sixth chapter of Romans. So then don't let sin rule your body, so that you do what it wants. Don't offer parts of your body to sin to be used as weapons to do wrong. Instead, present yourself to God as people who have been brought back to life from the dead. And offer all the parts of your body to God to be used as weapons to do right. Sin will have no power over you because you aren't under the law, but under grace. So what? Should we sin because we aren't under the law, but under grace? Absolutely not. Don't you know that if you offer yourself to someone as obedient slaves, that you are slaves to the one whom you obey? That's true whether you serve as slaves to sin, which leads to death, or slaves to the kind of obedience that leads to righteousness. But thank God that although you used to be slaves of sin, you gave wholehearted obedience to the teaching that was handed down to you, which provides a pattern. So now you've been set free from sin. You have become slaves to righteousness. And I'm speaking with ordinary metaphors because of your limitations. Once you've offered parts of your body to be used as slave to impurity and to lawless behavior, that leads to still more lawless behavior. Now you should present the parts of your body as slaves to righteousness, which makes your lives holy. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What consequences did you get from doing things that you are now ashamed of? The outcome of those things is death. But now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves to God, you have the consequences of a holy life, and the outcome is eternal life. The wages that sin pays are death, but God's gift is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. May your scripture always be my delight, O Lord. May I not be deceived in them or deceived by them. Amen. So a couple weeks ago, our neighbors to the south, Louisiana, passed a state law that the Ten Commandments are to be posted in every single classroom, public school classroom, uh, in their school systems in any, in any place in Louisiana. Now, I like the Ten Commandments. I did a preaching series on the Ten Commandments a couple of years ago. And last week, a bunch of us went to the Round Robin at First Magnolia, and uh, there in, on their sanctuary in the very front, as you're walking up to the entry door, are the Ten Commandments. But it's interesting, because if you look in the Gospels, 
you see that Jesus doesn't quote the Ten Commandments, does he? Nowhere. He references a couple of them from time to time, but he didn't talk about the Ten Commandments. And if you look at Paul, who's written most of the rest of the New Testament, Paul doesn't mention the Ten Commandments not even once. Or how about John, who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John and Revelations. He doesn't talk about the Ten Commandments at all either. Don't you find it strange that this was not what Jesus focused on. This was not what Paul focused on. This is not what the gospel writer of John focused on. In fact, Jesus said something entirely different. And let me read to you from the seventh chapter of the gospel of Mark. Then Jesus called the crowd again and said to them, listen to me. All of you and understand there is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile but the things that come out are what defile and when he had left the crowd and entered the house his disciples asked him about that parable he said do you still fail to understand do you not see that whatever goes into a person from the outside does not defile since it enters not into the heart, but in the stomach, and goes out into the sewer. Thus he declared all foods clean. And then he said, it is what comes out of a person that defiles. For it is within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, Latentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defy a person. Essentially what John says, and what the Gospel of Mark says, what Jesus says, and even what Paul says, is that evil is within us. It's not something external that we take in. It is within us. John Hick puts it this way. The essence of moral evil is selfishness. Selfishness. It's the sacrificing of others to one's own interest. It consists in Kantian terminology and treating others not as ends in themselves, but as means to one's own ends. This is what survival instinct demands. Selfishness. Now, if we're being honest, we know that. We know that. We all have a little bit of selfishness in us. And oftentimes, if we are in a mode of suffering, or in a mode of poverty, or in some kind of panic, our selfishness takes over to try and get us what we need to survive. God knows this about us. Jesus knows this about us. Our selfishness comes out in our attitudes of wanting things for ourselves, of protecting ourselves against things that we find threatening. It means that we don't want to play in the orchestra. We want to do our own thing. It means that we don't want to sing with the choir. We want to sing our own little solo in our own little way, in our own little rhythm. 
To be part of a community, to be part of a collective, means that you agree to put aside yourself to play with the group. You may have your own part to sing, whether it's soprano or alto or second soprano or bass or baritone or tenor. And you may even have a solo, but it is part of a whole. Friends, we weren't created to live isolated lives. We were created to live life in community. With a family, within a neighborhood, within a town, within a county, within a state, within a country, within a hemisphere, within the world. And when we get selfish, we destroy what's around us. Sometimes we get wounded, and when we get wounded, we start to think, oh, we're not enough. And we cannot see our own sins. Because sin, for us, has become transaction. This is my issue with the Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments are great, but they don't address the sin within us. They don't address the hurts and the longings and the insecurities and the patterns of behavior that we find in our minds, in our hearts, and as Paul would say, in our splunchness, in our very guts. And when we get wounded and when we get twisted and when we get hurt, our selfishness can get out of control and we don't even see it. And you can follow all the Ten Commandments and still be wounded and mean. That's why Jesus talked to us about loving our neighbor. It's why he said all of these little laws and all of these big laws can be summed up in two laws. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. When we start trying to love people in our families, people that are very different from us, people that have had a different life experience than us, when we try to start loving them and understanding them, we put aside our selfishness to hear their story and to understand their experience and, and to see the world through their eyes instead of ours. We also come to understand our own privileges. I grew up privileged and grow up wealthy, but I had the jackpot with my parents. I had the jackpot and that my parents took me to church. I had the jackpot and that the church I was raised in taught me how to love people. I had the jackpot with my education. I had my jackpot with so many things in my life that I didn't earn. There were gifts that were given to me. But I know so many people that didn't have those same privileges. 
And some were able to rise above and have a great life, and, and some of them struggled. But sin is when I look at my own life and say, I've earned everything I've gotten. And if you're poor, or if you're hungry, it just means you're lazy. That's selfishness, folks. And selfishness. We're not going to get to the root of the problem. Pinning up laws for people to follow. You can't fix what you don't see. Pharisees only saw the law. They didn't see the people. They didn't see the sick. They didn't see the suffering. That's their problem. They didn't see the poverty. They were in power. The Romans were in power. They didn't see because they didn't have to see. And sometimes we don't see because we don't have to see either. There's a group of people called Friends of Bill. Early you're well familiar with them, aren't you? And they understand the depths of sin better than we do. They understand the selfishness and the dark places that your very soul can wander through no fault of your own. And what they do understand is that none of us, not a single one of us, has the power to get out of that hole by ourselves. It's impossible. A few months ago, I talked to a young man who had just gone through uh, his first rehab. And when I suggested uh, the 12 Steps, and I suggested this little book by Trevor Hudson one day at a time, I could feel him turning me off. He could do it on his own. He had gotten sober. He had a good experience in rehab. He'd be able to return to his life and be able not to drink. He called me a few days later. He said, I'm scared. I've just faced the reality that I can't do this by myself. And so we called someone and asked, will you be my sponsor? Let me, if you're not familiar with the 12 steps, let me just run you through. And one of the reasons I love this little book is it looks at us as Christians and suggests that we go through our own process recognizing that we too are addicted to sin. We admit we're powerless over alcohol, that our lives have become unmanageable. We come to believe that a power greater than ours can restore us to sanity. We made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood God. We made a searching and fierce moral inventory of ourselves. We admitted to God, to ourselves, and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. We were entirely ready to have God remove all those defects 
of character. We humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. We made a list of all the persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. We made direct amends to such people where possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. We continued to take a personal inventory, and when we were wrong, we promptly admitted it. We sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God as we understand God, praying only for the knowledge of God's will for us and the power to carry that out. Having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, we try to carry this message to alcoholics and to practice these principles in all of our affairs. We're all selfish. We were born that way. We all like to march and beat our own drummer from time to time. And, and sometimes we, we cause a problem we didn't mean to cause. And instead of working towards reconciliation, we just try to ignore it and hope that it will go away. You can see what damage that, or how effective that is when you look at some of the sexual abuse that has been brought to light in various Christian churches. A pastor admitted that he had relations with a 12-year-old girl when he was in his 20s. And now here, 26 later, years later, I'm going to say I'm sorry to the church and just keep right moving on. But it doesn't work that way. To fully, to fully Come to grips with what redemption means, it means that you look at the damage that you caused that 12-year-old girl. How was her life changed? How was her future altered because of what you did? How in the world can you make amends? And until you're willing to look at those things, those hard things, and try to make right what you did wrong, redemption's not going to happen. To repent means to change directions. Fortunately, we are not people without hope. So, next week we'll be talking about Jesus Christ. And the following week we'll be talking about the Holy Spirit. And we're going to be talking about salvation the following week. God has made possible for every single last one of us to be redeemed, to be reconciled, to be made new and do not have any consequences, eternal consequences, for the damage we have caused. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.
for days of leisure that allow us to remove ourselves from the workaday world, for the chance to watch children at play, energized by the sunshine, reminding us that life, above all else, is to be enjoyed. We thank you for the getting away from it all days that allow us to get a new perspective on the gift of work, for the chance to be reminded that our toil is not a curse, but an affirmation of our worth, a working out of our call, and a participation in your work of creation. May these days of respite from work, whether we run the machine, mold the vision, count the parts, check the numbers, place the orders, build the towers, heal the body, feed the mind, or care for the spirit, serve to remind us that it's through our work that you've called us to join you in the redemption of your world. And remind us when we walk barefoot in the grass, or stand in the froth of the ocean, or lift the dripping ice cream from between our fingers, or lie back in awe of the countless stars in the summer sky, that you remain our God of joy and fun and laughter, that you are our God of free creation. We pray this in the name of your Son who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Gracious God, we are so blessed today to come together to worship you. So joyfully we bring these gifts. Bless the gift and the giver, and may they be used for your world. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. 